Good morning. I'm B.J. Stagner, pastor of Saren Chapel Independent Baptist Church. I hope and pray that today's sermon is a wonderful blessing to your heart and your soul. I want to encourage you to stay tuned at the conclusion of today's message for some vital information for you personally and those that are around you. For without further ado, here's today's sermon. Amen, amen, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Do hope and pray you guys uh, are ready for it this morning. I hope you guys have had a wonderful week, and uh, we're sure looking forward to getting into the Word of God today. Damn, my, my mic is on on there. Are you sure? On the computer? I just want to make sure you got that squared away, buddy, I know. Um, so today, guys, we're going to get into part two of what we started last week, God's recipe uh, to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And uh, it, it was a blessed principle. I just want to make sure you understand, if you look there in Proverbs chapter 3 with me, uh, Proverbs in chapter 3, and uh, the opening verse says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. And uh, I want to make it crystal clear today, guys. This is not talking, actually, I made it clear last week. I said that this is not talking about the 613 Jewish laws. There's a lot of false religions out there that, uh, that teaches that if you follow a dietary law that you're going to go to heaven. There's religions that teach you must abstain from pork and all this and that. That's all hogwash, guys. No pun intended with that. Amen. And, uh, but it is. That's not true at all. Uh, there has nothing to do with the dietary law that's going to make you any more... Um, uh, more spiritual, any more or less saved, not going to uh, happen at all. There are no laws, amen, as far as, as far as the commandments go, as we see in the Old Testament under that economy, uh, that's not applying to this. When it refers to the law of God, it's speaking of the Word of God. And it's speaking of our obedience as Christians of being obedient to His Word and following His commandments. Uh, so it's not talking about the Ten Commandments or anything like that. Ten Commandments was never, ever used, even in the Old Testament, even under the Jewish law, even under the Mosaic law, to, ver to bring salvation, but rather to prove guilt. Uh, the Ten Commandments was, is, is and still viable today for us to understand that when we look at those Ten Commandments, we can recognize our need for a Savior, okay? So it has nothing to do with following a tick list, if you will, uh, to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's not what um, <coughs> we are teaching in Proverbs chapter 3, and it's definitely not what uh, God is teaching either. So don't think that. I don't want you to get confused. And there's no reason you should have, but I just want to make sure we cover that. And Proverbs chapter 3, looking in verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 10 today. The Bible says, My son, forget not my law, uh, but let thine eyes keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bone. Honor the Lord with, all, with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Father, again, thank you for allowing us to be together today. We pray now that you'd bless this message, Lord, to the hearts and, and the minds and the souls of the hearers. Lord, in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. 
and amen. So point number one last week that we looked at in verses one through eight uh, was that of being healthy, uh, that of being healthy. And one of the things that we understand in a healthy life, uh, there's different types of health. There are uh, not only physical health, but emotional health, mental health, spiritual health. There's different types of health. And we understand that these principles spoken here, it, they're, they're, they're speaking of a physically healthy life. But there's also a byproduct of living for the Lord, a byproduct of honoring his, uh, his law, a byproduct of not forgetting his law. In other words, not forsaking his law, not forsaking his word a byproduct of following the commandments of God. One of which, guys, that we talked about, by, uh, that we talked about from the New Testament is in uh, Romans, chapter, um, Romans chapter 13 and verse 10. It says, Love worketh no ill will to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, for all of those, uh, uh, all of those out there that say that you know the the the, the law has been uh, eliminated. Now it hasn't been abolished, hasn't been written off. Uh, it has been fulfilled. That law has on the cross of Christ. But the principles that we've been given to live by, guy, there, guys, there's nothing wrong with them. So if the fulfilling of the law is to uh, to, to work no ill will to our neighbor. I mean, that probably gives us a pretty good understanding of how it says, uh, "So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man." All right, if we work no ill will to our neighbor, that's a pretty good sign, guys. I mentioned last week and, and, and overemphasized it quite a few times uh, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, uh, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Guys, if we would, and again, you may be saying, preacher, you're looking for a, you know, a, a utopia, you're looking for this. I'm not looking for that by any stretch of the imagination, but I do believe this today. That if my first thought in my life, when I begin to say something, do something, when I begin to commit to something or decommit to something, is the feelings of other people, the feelings of my fellow mankind, the feelings of my family. You know, before I decide to, uh, uh, before I decide just to, uh, just to throw in the towel or before I decide to say something negative to people or whatever, I need to think about my family, amen. I need to think about my friends. I need to think about our, our church and think about us together and, and the decisions that I make towards someone else. And again, if we'll start thinking that way, then you're going to begin to see in your own life a healthy mental, emotional, spiritual status, and I believe a byproduct maybe even to a physical status. And this is talking about length of days and long life. And the Bible tells us that uh, for children to obey their parents, so this is right in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible tells us to uh, honor, the, uh, honor your, your mother and your father, that thy days may be long upon the earth. Those are all byproducts, guys. Uh, uh, that's a byproduct of, of following the Word of God, of being obedient to the Word of God, and then we find that's the first segment in, the, in God's recipe uh, to being healthy. And then so today we want to get into point number two, and that is the word wealthy. Well, one, of the, uh, one of God's recipes here on how to be wealthy. Now this is where everyone's ears begin to, they begin to pick up, okay? If I was to probably put a post out or uh, do a leaflet drop here, you know, 20,000 leaflets and said, you, you know, you can f come and find out a uh, three-point plan this morning on how to be wealthy in your life, you know what? People would probably pack this place out. Now, uh, guys, listen, uh, you know, we want to know how can we be wealthy in our life. And, and guys, I know, and I know when I'm talking about finances, I'm speaking about something that's relevant. It's spoken of many a times in the Word of God. And uh, I know as a preacher, especially in the early days uh, of pastoring, guys, I avoided uh, preaching on finances. I avoided on preaching on, on things like that. And, and I probably should not have avoided it as much as I did. I may have preached one time uh, a year ever on finances. And it was just, that's just from being young. And it wasn't, I didn't know what to preach. But, you know, as a preacher, you get a little apprehensive. And then you got to stop and think about it. Paul said that he, he, he failed not to preach the whole counsel of God. Amen. I mean, I counseled people multiple times on financial issues. I put people on financial budgets. I put, I've worked out spreadsheets for their life to live by. And how, you, how if you're going to be a successful Christian, this is what you're going to have to do. And if you will follow these principles, you know what will happen. You know, at the end of 12 months, at the end of uh, 24 months, end of 48 months, you'll have money in the bank. Uh, you'll have your debts paid off, blah, 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 blah. And those things are all great and wonderful. But I will say this today, that uh, you, start preaching as, as a, you start preaching on finances uh, in the church house, people get real, real, real antsy. Somebody once said that uh, the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the nerve which runs from the heart to the pocketbook. And boy, I tell you, that is true. Everyone begins to get a little antsy when the preacher begins to speak on finances, guys. But I want you to slow down. Don't run off this morning. I can assure you that you and I both can learn a thing or ten 
from this biblical principle here found in the Word of God. Just as we did last week concerning the principle of healthy, we can look at this and find out about the principle of wealthy and how it can apply into our life. So look at verses 9 and 10. We finished with those here in ju just a moment ago in our re opening text. The Bible says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, again, you see these two verses. One's a cause, one is an effect, okay? If you reverse those things, then I guess you understand how that happens as well. So if you want your needs met, you want your barns filled, if you will, then you're going to have to honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. Now, I know this may be a touchy subject again, but it shouldn't be, guys. I mean, it usually is a, a, a touchy subject for those that are, that are stingy in their life, but it should not be. I mean, you keep holding on to it, guys. I'm going to tell you, as a Christian, if you are saved today, uh, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to do right with the finances that God has allowed you to keep. God's plan is for you to have liberty and freedom, guys. God's plan is for you not to be in bondage to your, and I'm going to age myself, your checkbook, okay? Uh, you know, does anybody still have a checkbook at all? Uh, I, I, do you, do you still have a checkbook? Amen. Not many of them. I, I saw an article years back that I thought we were getting rid of our checks here in the UK by like 2020, whatever, 2021, or I don't know, we're in 2021, so I guess we haven't got written them quite yet, have we? And, uh, and uh, so I, I do age myself, and I, I feel in company today that since there are still checkbooks living and alive, amen, uh, my mom still balances their checkbook out, you know, she, she gets the statement out, and she gets the checkbook out, and she balances it, amen, and, and you got to do that, you got to be, you got to be wise with your spending, but brother, God's plan is for us to have liberty in our life. If we live a stingy life, if we're going to hold on to what God has given us and not do with what God has told us to do, all right, then you're in bondage. That's just all there is to it. God does not want his children to be in bondage to anything or anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you're in bondage to the Lord Jesus Christ, guys, you have perfect liberty. For the Bible says, when, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. God's recipe for a wealthy life is to honor the Lord with your substance, hands down. That does not mean that you're going to be rich according to the world standards, but hang on. It also doesn't mean that you won't be either. Guys, I have seen God do amazing things financially in people's lives. Amazing things. Unbelievable things. I've also seen God uh, be just as tight with people who are just as tight with him. I've watched them, I've watched them both happen, guys. I, I can tell you that. And I can, I can tell you story after story after story after story of mine and Denise's life, of what God has done uh, in, in the past 23 years that she and I, uh, next month, of what, how he has blessed us in ways where we never in our life thought that we were even going to make it through. But the first thing we need to recognize when we look at uh, God's recipe and being wealthy. Now, there's going to be some sitting here or some online today that say, you know, you know I, I, don't, I don't need to hear this. Uh, or there's going to be some that say, I don't want to hear this. And you know what, guys? That is, that's going to be your priority. That's going to be your, your pri um, I, I forgot it. I forgot what word I'm looking for here. Uh, prerogative. That's your prerogative this morning that if you want to just switch off, that's fine. But I'm just, I'm just trying to encourage you this morning. This is God's recipe uh, for wealthy, just like it was God's recipe for healthy. The first thing that we need to recognize in our life is our priorities. I priorities. That is one of the principles that we need to understand. Look back there in verse 9 with me, and there's a clear statement here. <coughs> Very clear statement. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits, watch this, of all thine increase. Okay? Of all thine increase. Now, guys, uh, you know, think about that for just a second. Think about that principle, what he's saying, with all thine increase. You get a pay raise, well, you keep doing what you keep giving to the Lord the way you've always given or what you've always given, all thine increase, all right? The Bible speaks of it in 1 Corinthians 16, too, about uh, how the Lord has prospered you, amen? Uh, you know, this principle, guys, is nothing new. Matthew chapter 6, uh, Matthew chapter 6, and uh, I didn't put this verse up there. I thought I did, but Matthew chapter 6 and, uh, and, and verse 33 says, seek ye first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, again, I understand that we're coming to, uh, out, of the, uh, out of the Proverbs that was uh, uh, written by the wisest man who, who ever lived, but now we're, we're going into the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you will, turn in your Bibles over there uh, to Matthew chapter 6, and let's look at this. And again, I, I, I quote this verse, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, 
and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, look there at Matthew chapter 6 this morning. What things is he talking about, guys? Again, if we, if we relate this back into where we were in Proverbs 3, the Bible says that we honor the Lord with our substance and the first fruits of all thine increase. What's going to happen? Our barns are going to be filled with plenty. It didn't say, guys, you know what? It says, it says with plenty, and our presses shall burst out with new wine. Do you know what it didn't say? It didn't say you're going to have an exorbitant amount. That, that's not what it said. Now, your barn may be bigger than my barn, okay? You know, we may have the same size barns. But the Bible said we would have plenty. What, having plenty is relative, you understand? So look here in Matthew chapter 6 and notice this here. Uh, skip up to verse 25 with me. Verse 33 is where the Lord said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then he says, And all these things shall be added unto you. So if you go there in verse uh, 25, go to verse 25. Bible says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your, for your life, or what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, or what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father findeth, uh, feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? We, we spoke about this verse here uh, from another text on the, on the message from Worth here a couple weeks back. Verse 27. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, they neither do they, do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the, the grass of the field, which, is, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? In verse 31, he says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall, ye, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink? And wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things, watch this, do the Gentiles sink. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. And then he turns around and says, oh, you know, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and what? All these things shall be added unto me. Now he's saying the Gentiles. He's saying, he's saying the pagans. He's saying those who are not, uh, not a people. Uh, they're, not a, uh, they're not children of God. That's who he's talking about there when he says the Gentiles. Talking about, if we put it into to our terms today, he's talking about lost people. That lost people strive after these things, and they're all worried, and all this and that, and they're concerned with it. And whereas the Lord just said, just seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. <clears throat> to put that back into Proverbs chapter 3, honor uh, the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. The first fruits, guys, not the seconds, but the first. And then our so shall your barns be filled uh, with plenty, and your presses burst out with new wine. God is not going to take second place to anybody or anything, and we need to understand that in our life. It's easy for us to say that for our prayer life. It's, it's, it's more difficult to do, I understand. But we have no problem believing that in our prayer life. Most we have no problem believing that in our church life, our Bible reading life, our scripture writing life, even our own thoughts and emotional thoughts. We, you know, we have no pro problem believing that God needs to come first no matter what. But when it comes to these finances, God, when it comes to, to putting it, putting the, no, no pun intended, but putting the money, you know, putting the money where our mouth is, and when, when it comes to the principles that God has given us in finances, man, we tend to say, whoa, wait a second, hang on. And I, and I don't know where it comes from. I don't know why, why, why we are like that. I don't know why we trust God with a life we've never seen. We trust him with the word that we read every single day and how it blesses us every single day, and yet we close our pocketbooks. God is not going to take second place. Now, until we get that, until God is first place in your life, guys, you have no right to expect God to give you financial freedom, all right? Bondage from the finances in your life. Why should, why should God uh, uh, give you financial freedom if you're not going to give him his life first? Think about that. If you're not going to give it back, if you're not going to give uh, your life back to him, why is he going to do, why would he do that? God needs to be first in our life. You know, we're to love people, guys. We're to love people, we are to use things, and we are to worship God. But you know the problem in our society today? Our society worships money, loves things, and it uses people, doesn't it? 
If you stop and think about the characteristics of our society, our society today, the most of the time, most of the people that you'll meet, they're going to think about what they can get out of you when they can get out of you, and they're going to keep what they have. Kind of reminds you of the, uh, the story of the, the Good Samaritan. But guys, I do want you to understand this this morning. Wealth comes in many forms, but this principle here is directly tied to our substances. You cannot spiritualize this. I mean, I, don't, I know you, people would love to, but it, what, it is what it is, and therefore we have a choice today either to obey or not obey. We can keep giving the Lord a, a measly little tip, or we can honor the Lord with our substance. We can honor him with our first fruits, and that means off the top, first things first, and we can watch him bless and provide ten times over. I cannot stress it to you enough when you prioritize your finances in your life, when you put it where it belongs, God will bless you in ways, uh, in ways that, you, uh, that you can't even imagine. You know, so, so then, then what should we do? Well, we keep honoring him with all our increase. That's why he says honor him uh, with, with, your, with your, your first fruits, honor him with all your, sub, with your substance, and with all that increase. You know, what, you know why? When you honor him with your substance, when you honor him with your first fruits, he's going to give you more. When he gives you more, you're going to honor him more. And it, it's just a, a whole pattern that comes just like that, guys. And, and this is not a prosperity doctrine. Again, I said those barns, your barns may be bigger than my barn. Uh, you may be, uh, you know, you may be, your plenty may be more than what mine is, and that's fine. It's all relative one way or another. But I am trying to tell you this. This is the principle of prioritization when it comes to having the recipe that God has us for wealth in our life. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm going to tell you, God is good, man. God is so good. I, again, I've, I've told you time and time again, I can remember the days. I can remember the days when Denise and I were, were living in a house trailer uh, with a dog. She was pregnant and with a baby, all right? And we had a warpy floor, okay? My dad tried to repair that floor 10 times over, and for some reason, the warps kept coming back. It was like a roller coaster in there in the kitchen. Funniest thing you've ever seen in your life. Single wide trailer we lived in. And uh, I, I remember, you know, I just, just started my, my business a, a couple months prior to that. And uh, I remember having 70 bucks, $70 to our name, all right, which is about, you know, 50, 50 pounds. I said, honey, this is all I have. This is what we have for groceries. You're going to have to make it work. Rent's paid, ties paid, missions paid, everything's paid. And this is what's left. Do with what you can. And God bless that thing. God blessed in ways that you can't even imagine, guys. We never missed a tithe. We never missed a missions payment. Not one. And God blessed it. So, secondly, this morning, when it comes to being wealthy, there's not only the, 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 the principle of prioritization or pri to prioritize, but there's the principle of productivity. And now, guys, this is something that is a little bit different when we begin to think about what is God's recipe. People always seem to think that if I can be wealthy, uh, you know, I, I won't have to work any longer. If I can be wealthy, I won't have to work. And, and I'm going to tell, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, and I, it's human nature. It's human nature to try to take the easy way out or try to take the lazy way out. I get that. And I know there are some that, that think that, that they, they, if they figure if they just had enough money, uh, they wouldn't have to be productive any longer in life. Can I say this to you this morning? That would be an absolute disaster for you if, if you're not productive in life in some way, shape, form, or fashion. It doesn't matter how much money you have. God wants you to work in some type of form. Uh, you say, well, what about when I retire? That doesn't, we all, you all should have a, a, a chance to retire. Most of you guys are retired here. You know what? That is your reward for laboring all your life. But what, what it also means is gives you more of an opportunity once you retire to serve the Lord. That's what that means. God, God wants you to work at something. Uh, it, it, may be, it may be a diligent prayer life. Working does not always have to be laborious with your body, okay? Uh, being productive in your life doesn't always have to be physically doing something. Matter of fact, some of, the most, some of the most important parts of laboring is laboring in prayer. You give me 10 women who labor in prayer, I'll take that over 10 men who will walk these streets any single day, uh, any day of the week. I promise you that right now. 10 women that will labor in prayer, that will diligently pray for me and for this church right now, I'll take that over 10 big, bustling, burly men. Amen? I sure will. I can tell you that. I know a preacher one time, famous preacher, that used to have a, about 10 or 20 ladies up underneath the pulpit. They had a big platform for a pulpit, but they would be praying throughout the entire service for that man of God, for souls to be saved out inside that congregation. Listen, uh, guys, don't talk to him. Don't, don't tell me that prayer is not productive, okay? Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs in chapter 20 with me. Proverbs in chapter 20. I want you to see this principle of productivity when it comes to being wealthy. 
under God's recipe for wealthy. <coughs> Proverbs 20, look at verse 4 with me. Verse 4, you, you probably have heard the verse, I'm sure. The Bible says, The slugger will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Now, guys, I want you to think about this. <clears throat> we had a little bit of a cool morning this, this morning, and uh, cooler than it has been as of late. I think the, the heat is on out there, so your backsides are warm. At least I hope it's on. I, I didn't check it when I got here this morning. Um, but listen, what happens on these cool mornings? The old sluggard wakes up. Alarm clock goes off. He knows the field needs to be plowed. And, and well, you know what? Uh, the fields ain't going to plow themselves. I'll go ahead and tell you that much. Well, when, it, when he sees that little uh, colder weather that's dropped and he sees that temperature has gone down in the single digits and it feels so warm to be underneath those, those warm covers inside the house there, you know what he sees? He goes, man, you know what? I'm not going to go out today. I'm going to take it easy today. I'm going to kick back. I'm going to relax. And so he pulls the covers over his head, pulls them up to his chin, if you will, and he continues on sleeping. He hits the snooze button over and over and over until he finally hits stop. Now, you know what's going to happen? He's not going to prosper in his life. The bottom line is, he, it, it, it's not, he, he's, God is not going to answer his prayer of prosperity. Uh, he's not going to answer his prayer. And it's not because God has failed him. Dear friend, it's just because he's lazy. And God is not going to bless laziness. I promise you that. Look there in Proverbs chapter 20. Look down in verse 13 with me. Look in verse 13. <clears throat> Here is a very clear statement. The Bible says, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. That's plain as day. Shall be satisfied with bread. That is plain as day when you begin to look at the, the, this, this idea, this principle of productivity. Look over in Proverbs 28 with me real quick. All under this eyes, guys, of God's recipe for uh, to be wealthy. Uh, it starts with prioritizing, prioritizing uh, your, your income, prioritizing your, your finances so that you're not in bondage to them. Secondly, it goes into being productive in your life. Proverbs 28, verse 19 says, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. Again, guys, plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. Now, remember, the writer of the Proverbs is talking, he's speaking to farmers. So you'll have to make this application into your own life. But think about it. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. That word till means to farm or to plow his land or to cultivate, meaning to work. He who works the land, guys. Do you know what a vain person is that it speaks of there in Proverbs uh, chapter 28? This is the guy who says, man, you know what? You don't have to work. Just follow me and I'll show you to have something for nothing. I mean, guys, listen, there, there, is, there is no such thing as getting something from nothing in this life. It does not happen. Someone, somewhere is paying for it. Now look at the very next verse, Proverbs 28, verse 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. All these people, guys, that are they play the lottery every single week. They choose the numbers, pick this, do the scratchers. I got so tired of showing up here on church on Sunday morning, and there'll be a pile of uh, uh, scratcher tickets uh, torn up in, in, uh, into little teeny bitty pieces and thrown on our windowsill the back hall back here of the church. I mean, you know, I, I know it's probably too much for these people to, you know, to tear their tickets up over the rubbish bin because that's where they need to go anyway. It's only about 20 yards the opposite direction. They could have stopped when they came out of the market, scratched them, saw they failed for the 150th millionth time, tore them up and thrown them in the bin, and not left them there for us to clean on a Sunday. But that's the character trait of these people who are hooked on those things, okay? The Bible says that a, that a faithful man should abound in blessings, but he may either make it haste to be rich, shall not be innocent, guys. I mean, how many times do we show up here in the cash point empty down the road here because these sluggards are in the, the betting uh, place right down the road here on Saturday nights emptying out the cash point, man, wasting money. I got news for you. Do you know why Vegas has all the lights on the planet, it seems? Do you know how they can illuminate that place? My soul, you know, Las Vegas was started by a gangster, by Bugsy Siegel for all people. Do you think a gangster's looking out for your well-being? For you to come and waste God's money and, and the money that God has given you to support your family? No, that city, is, that city is built on blood money, man. Amen. It's built on blood money. They shall not be innocent, the Bible says. Now, Paul said this. He says, if any will not work, neither should, should he eat. 
the principle of productivity when it comes to being wealthy in your life. Number one, you've got to prioritize what God has already given you. He's not going to give you more if you're not faithful to him and that which uh, he has already given you. And if you're only giving back that 10%, you're only giving back what is already his, man. I know all of it's his, but he's allowing you to keep the 90 to do something right with, uh, to, for him, amen. We, guys, listen, we all, we all have some people who really think that work is a dirty word. They think laboring is a dirty word, and they think the government perhaps should owe them a living. Beloved, you cannot legislate the poor into freedom by legislating the wealthy out of it. You can't do it. It doesn't work. You can't show me one country on this planet that has a positive income that is based upon communistic ideologies. They fail, every single one of them. Amen? It is not a biblical, don't get quiet on me here, man. It's not a biblical principle. God has given us the biblical principle of productivity. And, and what one person received without working, another person must work without receiving it. The government cannot give anybody anything that the government does not first take from someone else. Think about that for just a second. When half of the people, guys, get the idea they don't have to work because the other half is going to take it from them, and when the other half get the idea, it does, it does no good to work because somebody else is going to get it. Uh, when they work for it, dear friend, what happens is, is the end of a nation, the end of an economy. It doesn't work. The Bible says, six days thou shalt labor. We see that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. And we see that in, uh, uh, we see that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. And we see that in Deuteronomy 5, 13. Uh, you know, in the very same Bible, the Bible says, one day thou shalt rest. Exodus 23, 12. And so many of us refuse uh, that the Bible says, uh, uh, one day thou shalt rest. But, you know, we, we'll, we'll take that. We, we remember that he says, one day you should rest. I get that. But we fail to remember that we should work six days, six days labor. You know what Adrian Rogers said? Adrian Rogers said, you cannot multiply wealth by dividing it. Amen? That's simple mathematics. I don't care if it's new math. I don't care if it's... Uh, curriculum wells for 2022 math uh, i don't care if it's old math that we learned when we were young kids math is math okay that's all there is to it you cannot multiply anything by dividing it it does not work all right now so that's the principle of being the, the principle of being wealthy starts with priorities put god first honor the lord with thy first fruits with all that increase seek ye first the kingdom of god secondly uh, the, the principle of wealthy is, is that we need to be productive, okay? He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. And I want to emphasize this. Physically speaking, you may not be able to do what you once could do, but beloved, you can pray. You can labor in prayer. You can labor in word. You can There's things that, you, that every single one of us can do. If all of us could do the same thing, then what we, we'd be a boat going around in a circle now, wouldn't we? That's what we'd be doing. But there's the principle thirdly, and lastly this morning. There's the principle, you saw it accidentally hit the button a moment ago, of philanthropy, of philanthropy. And I want you to see a, a, a great recorded event. I'm going to put it on the screen just to save some time this morning. <coughs> but a great recorded event in Israel's history. And again, for time's sake, I just want to hit the high points. We all remember the story of Nehemiah going into Jerusalem, to rebuild the walls, and to set up uh, the gates, okay? And when we see the story, but there's a little part, and I'm not saying it's hidden. You've, you've read it a dozen times, I'm sure, and you probably even know it. But I want you to read this as Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5, you're going to see it from the screen. Um, as he's continued to work and repair the wall and set up the gate, what, watch what we find here. Uh, we're going to look in uh, verse 17 and 18. I'm going to read all of it together in just a moment. It says, Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers, besides those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now, now I just want to stop for a second. I, I broke this apart for a reason. This is Nehemiah's table, all right? Nehemiah was responsible for feeding 150 of the leaders and the workers uh, who were in this project, all right? Now, besides, besides that, all of the people who were not even believers in God, the heathen, amen, they came in as well. Now, this is when a lot of people go, oh, hey, hang on a second here. What are they doing here? Man, they're working just as hard as the people of God are, and we've got to stop and think about that. They came in as well. And you know what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah helped to feed them. Now, he did this out of his own pocket, and he didn't do this out of the government resources that was given. He did it out of his own pocket. Notice with me here, now, now that which was prepared for me, 
this is verse 18, daily was, daily was one, was, uh, sorry, daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me and once in ten, uh, ten store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all of this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. Now think about it. This is the principle of philanthropy in Nehemiah's life. This is part of God's recipe in our life as believers today. Now, this is what he said. He goes, listen, uh, they, were so, they were so much already in bondage, I could not tax them anymore. Remember, whatever's coming from the governor had to start out and come from the people. So Nehemiah said, I can't do it. They're under too much bondage. I mean, the need was too great. And since he, since he didn't, uh, since he, 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 this is what he's saying, since I did not uh, use the money that, that would have been given, been legitimately mine, what I would be paid for, he goes, I'm going to take care of the expense. Because the peach of people were so destitute. They were in such a destitute position. Nehemiah said, I reached out in my own pocket. And out of my own pocket, with my own personal wealth, I fed more than 200 uh, people every single day. At my own table, I gave them I gave them meat and drink. Guys, there is the principle of philanthropy. And beloved, if you want God to bless you, be, be willing to share what you have with other people. It's this simple. It, it, it's, the, it's the proper order. And too many churches, guys, you know, have it backwards. They rob from God to give to others because in their mind they feel that if they do, new, do enough good works, they'll go to heaven. That's never been true, and that's never going to be true. Amen? You're not going to work your way to heaven. There's not one work you can ever do to get yourself to heaven. But if you want to be blessed in this life, then when you can help, when it's in your, need, when it's in your means, when you have the ability to do so, we need to help other people. You say, well, is that just Christian people? It needs to be Christian born-again people first. Absolutely. He that seeth his brother in need and have this word goods and, and giveth not unto him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? That's what the Bible says. But at the same time, if you want to reach people in this world, you need to be kind to them. You need to help them out in some way, shape, form, or fashion so that you may be able to bring the gospel to them so that they know that you're not only putting, a, uh, you're putting your, your money where your mouth is, you're putting your, your works where your words are. Do you understand this morning? God has given us these principles, guys. God's principles to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. We saw healthy last week. It's talking about a long life. There's also a health that is spiritual, a health that is physical, a health that is emotional. And this week we see, guys, how to be wealthy. And I'm going to tell you, you'll never have any time. Again, wealth is relative, guys. The Bible says about the barns being full, meaning your barn, and you'll have plenty. Your needs will always be met. All these things shall be added unto you. If you put God first, you're never going to outgive him. I can remember people in our church, the, my, our first church we were in, where I was saved and sent out as a preacher uh, under, under Dr. Ellis. We had a guy in that church there. Uh, when missions year came around, and he he would sit there, and uh, he he was a pretty pretty well to do businessman, but not not like you would think. You understand? He was still growing a business, and so when he had we had, we had missions meeting, and he decided to to, to pray because it's faith promise. Okay, when you promise to give to missions, guys, you, you're you're not looking at your abundance and saying, well, "Let me do this, and I can do this." It's faith. You're trusting by God that you're going to be able to give it for the next year. That's that's called faith promise given or grace purpose given, as we call it. But this man, when, they, when, he had these, uh, when they had a faith promise meeting, this man would sit back and he would calculate, in his mind, what he wanted to make the next year, not what he made the year before. And this is crazy. I was a, I'm a young man watching this stuff going, and, and at that time, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a young man making $6 an hour, okay, with a college degree, 6 bucks an hour, about $4.20, 4 pounds and 20 uh, since, as a matter of fact, at that time, it probably would have been about three pounds an hour uh, when because conversion was so bad in those days. And I'm watching this guy, and he would calculate what he wanted to make the year before. And I asked Pastor, uh, what do you want to make the, the year to come? And I asked Pastor Ellis, what's he doing? He goes, just watch. And he goes, okay, I'm going to give, and he give X amount of dollars to missions. He committed it for that next year. And Pastor Ellis said, watch what happens over the next year. And I'm like, that ain't going to happen, man. That's crazy. I said, there's got to be a catch here somewhere. This guy's got a rabbit in a hat. He knows what he's going to do. It, 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 there's, this, there's more to it. A year after year after year after year. That guy, he gave over 10% of his total income, all right? Pre-tax, pre-bills, pre-everything. 
whatever he wanted his company to make, he gave 10% to missions. And that guy was given 150, 200,000 a mission every year in a little old church. It was unbelievable. I'd never in my life seen something like that. i never in my life, but that's faith. That's God. That's how God works. You know what he did? He prioritized what he wanted to do. He prioritized his, um, his, um, his income. He prioritized his funds. Uh, guys, same thing when it comes to being productive. You know what? The, the fields are not going to plow themselves. I got so convicted. I was working on this yesterday morning, and I knew I was under the weather. I, I'm telling you what, when you take this and you put this in a spiritual perspective, these fields out here that we live in, they're not going to plow themselves, amen? Now, we've known that. I know we hit the ground running in 2014. We hit the ground running. We hit doors. We put leaflets and gospel tracts and, and John and Romans through every single door uh, in this valley. Andy is back there working his, with him and his family week after week. They're getting John and Romans and, uh, and online programs uh, into people's doors throughout South Wales. They're working week. They're not going to plow themselves. But yesterday, I, and I knew, I, and I was, I was so tempted. I wanted to get my new uh, box of uh, tracts. And hit the streets. But I knew, I knew that I'd, I'd pay for it today and then later on this week. So I'm holding off. But I'm going to plow these fields come this week, amen, by God's grace. you got, you got to get out and be productive, amen. Second, thirdly, we, we got to be philanthropic. we have got to have philanthropy in our life. It's not based on a number. It's not based on a percentage. It's based on what God would lay on your heart to help people, amen, help them to bring them to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, help a person they need. Sometimes it's going to cost you something. I learned that from two, two well-known missionaries, one named Mike Roberts and one named Tommy Morrow. Tommy, not Tommy Morrow, Tommy Thompson. Uh, Brother Tommy Morrow is a pastor friend of ours in Kentucky, supporting pastor. Tom, Tom, Tommy Thompson, or Tommy Tillman, sorry, I'll get the names right, my head's off. But Tommy Tillman was a missionary to the lepers. And uh, he went through there when, his, when he first went uh, to the country there in, uh, outside of Cambodia, in Mongolia. And he gave a gospel tract to a guy on the street. The guy reached up and grabbed it with two stumps. And whatever language he spoke in, and Tommy understood it, he said, you know what? He said, he said you Christians come over here and you, you tell us how we need to live and, how, and what we need to do, but you never see how we live. You come over here and you tell us what we need to do and what decisions we need to make, but you, you, you never come home with us and have a meal. Tommy said, let's go. Tommy went into, went into his house, him and his wife, both of them missing arms and with their, their little residual limbs, they made a meal for him. He sat there and ate the meal. He stayed the night with them, talked to them throughout the night, left the next morning. God called him to that country to be a missionary, was there for multiple decades, and 16 stints later in his heart, he's still serving God. Son did the same thing over in Cambodia. Listen, I'm trying to tell you something, guys. It's going to cost you something if you want to win people. But God's never going to let, he's never going to let you be left on the street begging bread. Your barns will burst out. You'll be wealthy one way, one way or another, in some way, shape, form, or fashion. God will make sure it comes back to you. Solomon said, cast thy bread upon the water. And thou shalt find it after many days. Will you bow your heads this morning? Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We pray now that you please would hear our prayers and answer them according to thy will. I pray you take your biblical principles, Lord, that we've heard this morning, write them into our hearts. I pray that we would be faithful to you, dear Lord. And I pray that if we evaluate our life and where we are with our priorities, where we are with our productivity, and where we are with our philanthropy, Lord, I ask of you to help us make those adjustments in our life today. Bless every soul that is here this morning. I thank you so much for the, for the wonderful turnout today. I thank you for everyone being in the house of the Lord today. I pray you bless the rest of their Sunday. And Lord, I ask that you please continue to watch over each and every one of us. Lord, give us guidance, grace, mercy, and direction in these days. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do hope and pray the sermon you just heard was a tender blessing to your heart and to your soul. I hope that it gives you the encouragement, edification to face the challenges that we see each and every day and week throughout our life. I'd like to invite you out to one of our live services here at Seren Chapel in Abraham. 
We are located on Lewis Street as well as Davis Street. Davis Street is the entrance to our chapel, and as well as Lewis Street is the entrance to our hall, and you can use either one of them. But secondly today, guys, I would like to share just a brief message to you now to ask you to where you are going in eternity. If today was the last day you were alive, if today, by some tragedy, this was the last moment you had on this earth, when you closed your eyes, would you wake up and see Jesus Christ? It is a simple question, guys, and it is even a more simple answer. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, paid the ultimate price for mankind. He gave us the free pass to eternal life by giving his life on the cross of Calvary, being buried into that grave, but rising again on the third day. It is simple as this. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, guys, while we were sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us so much that he gave his life. As a matter of fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sin is defined as the transgression of God's law. But what happened was the payment with, for mankind is death. Romans 6.23 clearly tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask you today, what would, what would stop you right here, right now, from bowing your head and saying a prayer much like this, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you stepped up out of the grave to give us victory over sin and victory over death. I invite you into my heart and ask forgiveness of my sins and ask you to lead God and direct me throughout the rest of my life. Now, here's the thing. You say that prayer in your own words, but you have to say it and believe in it. Remember, Romans 10, 9 says, And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is a promise from the word of God. That is a promise from God himself. That is the promise from the creator of all things, that if you'll believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, ask forgiveness of your sins, accept his free gift and pardon of sin into your heart today, that you will be born again, that you will have eternal life in heaven. Guys, I hope and pray this is a blessing to you today. I hope and pray that you make that decision. And if you have, if you've made that decision today, let us rejoice with you. Come by and see us here at the church or hit us up online at any of the social media outlets or through email or however you can. Just share with us the glorious transformation that you just received in your life. Guys, I hope to see you soon in the house of God. I hope to see you soon right here in Sharon Chapel. And may the Lord be with each and every one of you. God bless.